Welcome back to ECE 441A, 541A. Your pre-quiz is due on Monday, and Monday we will not be in class. That's Labor Day. You don't have to be in class, but you do need to finish up your pre-quiz if you haven't. Homework number one is due that week on the 11th. That's probably a Sunday, I believe. And that's due at 11:59. If you submit it through the Dropbox, you can bring it to class if you get if you finish it by that time, and I can collect the hard copy. So you can turn it in either through a Dropbox or the hard copy form. And if you want, you can put it in my ECE mailbox. If you're on campus, you can drop it in my ECE mailbox, which is on the north end of the ECE building in the, on the second floor. Students that are taking the class maybe are not coming from an electrical engineering background and they've been asking is there some material that we could review and so I've included a new module on the D2L website that says review material. Inside that there's another sub module that I've labeled electric circuit review and I give you a link to a book that you can access through the U of A library and I've provided a couple of lectures worth of notes and videos that if you wanted to watch me derive some equations of motion or the governing equations of a more elaborate circuit you can that material is now posted on the content page of D2L and I think I sandwiched it between course resources and unit zero so this is a review material module on D2L. What I want to do today is go through developing the equations that govern the dynamic behavior of this three mass system. And this should get you prepared for the problems that you will face on the homework and the exams. And we will be doing these in one direction. We're not going to worry about the gravitational pull on these may be in the y direction. We're just worrying about the x direction dynamics. We're not assuming any dynamics in the y direction. So this is one dimensional dynamic behavior. That's enough to keep us busy for our homeworks and exam problems. And you should see something similar to this on one of your homework assignments. It may just be a two mass problem. I'm buying time to let you sketch that, but as you are sketching, if you were thinking about a state space representation, what would you maybe be anticipating as far as the dimension of your state vector? Based on extending what we had talked about earlier with the single mass system, what was the dimension, state variable dimension, of our single mass spring damper system. It was two, wasn't it? We had one mass, and that mass, in order to describe its dynamics, we needed its position and velocity. And that we could then determine its acceleration, and that was good enough to give us our two states, position and velocity, for that single mass. With that background, what would you anticipate this one might produce in terms of a dimension of a state vector? Six, that would be the obvious. We'll show that that's not quite what we have, but we do have at least six. We have two from each of these masses, and now we have to figure out, is there something else? What are we missing? So that's what we want to be clear on with today's class. First, let's go ahead and assign position variables. Pardon? Is there a U2? I think there is a band called U2. But there's no input called U2. I just labeled it U sub 3 because it's pushing on mass 3. And there's no applied external force passing on M sub 2. 
So I do just have two inputs, and for non-intuitive reasons, maybe, I've labeled them U sub 1 and U sub 3. The question was, is there a U sub 2? Or is there a U2? And, and I just created this. This is the system that I created. I could have introduced another external reference input somewhere else, and then I might have labeled that U sub 2 but I labeled it consistent with where these external forces are being applied to the particular masses. But I do just have two inputs, external inputs. Now what I want to do is assign position variables, and one way that you could think of this is which points in the system can move independent of the other points or of the others if all the other points are held fixed. That's really the question that you want to be asking yourself as you're trying to lay down or identify or position variables in this system. Let's just sort of walk our way through the different masses. We need to know the position and velocity of mass 1. And with that, we can simply either draw a line in the sand, paint something on the floor. We need to identify where it is that we're calling zero for the position of mass one. And that's this blue vertical line that I've indicated. And let me just call this Z sub one. And if I held all of the masses fixed except for mass 1, I could move that mass and all the other masses could be held fixed. So that's a valid position variable. What about mass 2? Same thing, if I fix mass 1 and mass 3, I can now independently move mass 2 and I'll just put a line there and say relative to that line that's where zero is and that's going to be my position for mass 2 and I'm calling that z sub 2. Likewise for mass 3 if I hold mass 1 and mass 2 fixed then I can still move mass 3 independent of those other masses being fixed. And based on the discussion that I started with in terms of this having more than, so these three would, if you take position and velocity of those three points, you now have your six state variables. But there's actually an, yes. What's the other one? So in between K2 and B2, if you fix mass 1, mass 3, and mass 2, do you see that you could actually move? There's some flexible or movement in spring 2 and dash pot B. And that's our fourth position that we now need to identify. And then we're finished. But that's now a massless point. If you wanted to, you could sort of put this virtual block there and say it has zero mass, but at least it gives me a feel for another possible movement independent of the other ones being fixed. And we'll see, because it's massless, it's not giving us the need to have the velocity of that point. We just need to know its position. So, in fact, we are going to end up with a seventh order state vector.
position velocity for the three masses, that gives us six, and then the position of that fourth location between spring two and dash pot two. Questions on that as far as identifying, so you fix all of the points in your system and see are there any other locations that could move independently when all the others are tied down. Now let's start driving the equations for each of these pos identified positions. Let's look at the free body diagram. For mass one. There's mass one, and hopefully you have on your paper the ability to quickly sort of look back and forth. I'll be scrolling maybe up and down. But the obvious forces now, the first one I'll just quickly put in so that I don't forget, but that externally applied reference input is definitely a force that will influence the movement of mass one, and let me just go ahead and say, okay, here's the position, Z1, for that particular mass. And if we move this mass, M1, in the direction, if we virtually move it in the direction of Z sub 1, what forces now become active or become present when we try to move mass 1 in the direction of Z sub 1. If I simply walked up to that mass and tried to push it, it, it has some inertia, doesn't it? So it has an inertial force that we're using to basically not have to worry about mass times acceleration. Let's go ahead and indicate that and say that that is F sub I for my mass one. So that's many subscripts and I'll probably have a lot of different subscripts and different locations of these just so that we keep track of what's going on between the different free body diagrams. So that's the inertial force due to mass one. What else happens if I try to push M1 in the direction of Z1? What opposes that movement or what forces now become active? There's a lot, aren't there? K1, spring force. B1, dash pot or damper force. K3, opposes and K sub 2 opposes. They all want to be directed in an opposite direction to the way that I'm wa wanting to move it or how I've labeled Z sub 1. And in order to keep track of this, because I'm going to be labeling a lot with respect to different springs, I'm going to give another notation. Let me say this is in free body diagram one, this is force K sub one. So that left subscript is because I'm now labeling this to distinguish it from maybe an F sub K one that I do later when I'm doing a different free body diagram. K one won't be, but I might have some others. Here is, was this K sub three? K sub 2. So now I'm going to say this is free body diagram 1, F sub K sub 2. This was free body diagram 1 relative to dash pot 1. We also have in free body diagram 1, F sub K sub 3. And what we've done, let me just write down what I was trying to get us to 
perform, since you may not be listening to me, you may be listening to you too instead of worrying about it as a reference force or an externally applied force. Let's determine which forces are present when mass 1, m sub 1, is moved in the positive z1 direction. And we've now identified and labeled those forces. And now what we want to do is express those forces that I've labeled or identified in terms of the position variables, velocity variables, and the coefficients, the k's, the b's, etc. Now define the forces in terms of the coefficients, let's say, k sub i, b sub i, m sub i, positions and velocities. For example, in free body diagram 1, f sub k sub 1, what's that force? I want to now define it such that I actually produce a force in the direction that I've indicated it's moving as positive. So now I'm assuming that I want a positive result in going left for F sub K1. How do I write that in terms of my K's, B's, Z's, and Z primes? That's just K sub 1, Z sub 1. That's stretching that K1 spring by an amount Z1. And that will produce that force going to the left. How about F in spring 1, I'm sorry, in free body diagram 1, the force due to dash pot B sub 1. So that's now B1, the coefficient, the damping coefficient, times the velocity, which is Z1 prime. There's nothing, we don't have to worry about the relative movement of that dash pot or the spring, K1 or B1, because the left side is fixed. In a minute, it will get a little bit more interesting because we have another side to it and we have to worry about their difference being positive. We simply say that this is B sub 1, Z1 prime. And F sub I, M sub 1, the inertial force, that's our Newton, isn't it? Mass times acceleration, that's M sub 1, Z1 double prime. In free body diagram 1, F sub K sub 2, we now want the force to be going to the left relative to spring K sub 2. And I like to just sort of try to visualize this so I might be moving my hands around. But I now want a net force to be going to the left. If I held Z sub 4 fixed and pulled Z1 or the left side of K1 in the positive direction of Z1, where would the force be directed? Couldn't read my hand signals. Left or right? It's going to be going left, and that's what I want, isn't it? I need that to be positive. I'd say, okay, this is going to be K sub 2, Z1 minus Z sub 4.
So as long as z1 minus z sub 4 is positive times a positive k sub 2, that's going to give me a force to the left. Because z sub 4 can move, if z1 moves a little bit more than z4, I'm still going to have that positive force going to the left. The signs will take care of themselves if z4 now moves a little bit more or a little bit less, but now relative to how I've defined f sub 1 sub k sub 2, I will obtain a force going to the left if z1 is larger positively than z sub 4 in this expression. And then I have my last force in free body diagram 1, which is F sub K sub 3, to be associated with the K sub 3 spring. And now what do I want to, I now that's relative to position Z1 and position Z3, and if I want the force to be going to the left, now what do I need? in my displacement term. I now have spring constant times displacement. As long as Z1 is more positive from, than Z sub 3, then I have this force going to the left. So that now I have this is times Z sub 1 minus Z sub 3. And I can now do the sum of the forces. Since I've incorporated my inertial force, I don't have to say the sum of the forces are equal to mass times acceleration. I just say the algebraic sum of my forces need to sum to zero. And I simply look at my free body diagram and I start putting all of the left arrows on one side and all the right pointing arrows on the other side and that's then my equilibrium condition. In this case I have F sub 1 sub K sub 1 plus F sub 1 sub B sub 1 plus F sub 1 sub K sub 2 plus F sub 1 sub K sub 3 plus F sub I sub M sub 1 equaling the only one going right was U sub 1, the externally applied force. So I had every, I had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 going left and one going right to produce this equilibrium relationship. And now I replace all of these F's with what I just found from the physical relationships on the constants and the positions and velocities. And I may rearrange that because I like to sort of go from highest power derivative to lower power, so my inertial force I'll use first. That's m sub 1, z sub 1 double prime. I've now taken care of that one. Plus b1, z1 prime. That's that one. Plus k1, z1. That's that one. Plus k sub 2. That was z1 minus z sub 4. And then I had a plus, so I'm still on the left, k sub 3, z sub 1 minus z sub 3, that's that one, is equal to u sub 1. And that's one of my dynamic equations that starts to help us describe the dynamic behavior of this interconnected three mass system. You can see that it's interconnected because I have positions of 
mass one, mass three, that point in between the second spring and the dash pot, one of the dash pots, dash pot number two. Questions on that equation? Pardon? Are you getting... Yes, so you'll need to drive this for the exams. And maybe you'll have a 10 mass system for the exams. This is just a three. So this, this is, we're learning how to crawl, okay? I'll be nice and maybe restrict it to just a 10 body problem on the exam. That might be one of five questions on the exam. Let's look at free body. Again, I said I could sign drop forms anytime. <laughs> you could probably still do that online. Free body, and speaking of exams, I'll try to have some exams posted on D2L, some previous exams, not this exam, unless I really mess up, but previous exams so that you can get a feel for what those exams might look like heading into exam number one, et cetera. Free body diagram for mass number two. Now you can go back to your diagram. It's up in the upper right-hand corner and sketch mass two and say, okay, what happens when I slide that or try to move that in the direction of Z sub two? What results now? If I move this in the direction of Z sub 2, what forces are present? I was hoping that was still in your notes. Now if you, because I don't want to make you sick scrolling, but maybe next time you'll bring your Dramamine and you'll pop that before class. Where are we at? I'm not spinning yet. Mass 2, what forces? You have B2 and the inertial force. That's all. There's no externally applied force to that, so we now have the inertial force F sub I sub M sub 2 and which way is the force due to the dash, second dash pot? It's going to the left, isn't it? It's opposing that movement. So it's free body diagram two, so I'll put a two there, and this is F sub two sub B sub two. F sub I sub M sub two is just Newton. That's M sub two, Z sub two, double prime. F 2 sub B sub 2 is what? That's a dash pot. It's now going to be proportional to the velocity. And the constant or the coefficient is B sub 2. What points need to be included in my velocity expression that scales B sub 2? So now it needs to be Z2 minus Z4 primes. So I now have Z sub 2 prime minus Z sub 4 prime. And the sum of the forces equaling 0. Now I have F sub I sub M sub 2 plus F2 sub B sub 2 equals 0. They're both going in the same direction. Or I now have M sub 2, Z sub 2 double prime plus B sub 2, Z sub 2 prime minus Z sub 4 prime equaling 0.
these are just you're just chugging through these. That's why ten body problem wouldn't be that much effort on exam number one. And you'll have fifty minutes for that exam and you'll have five problems. So you need to crunch through that in ten minutes. One minute per mass. One minute per body. Ooh, is this we're we're not dissecting any bodies, so we're okay, I I think. It might take us more than a minute per body if we were doing that, but you're just writing the equations of motion for these bodies. Now what do we do? Let's move on to mass number three. I don't know why my masses get different sizes, but there's mass three. I just want to see it. I want it to be big. And now, based on this original picture, we need to identify the forces when we move mass three in the z sub three direction. And two that are easy are the externally applied force, u sub 3, and the inertial force, m sub 3, relative to the positive z sub 3 direction that we've indicated in our diagram. What else do we have acting on that when we displace it in the direction of the right direction z sub 3? I we have the damper B3 and we have the spring K3. Those will both contribute forces and they'll both be directed in the left direction. Now I have a force F in the three free body diagram number three, this is F sub B sub three, and in free body diagram number three, F sub K sub three. The reason I'm putting that three and the two and the one on the left is to distinguish that between the F sub K sub three maybe that we had earlier in a different free body diagram. Question. So now what the question is if the externally applied force U sub three is going to the left, why isn't everything going to the left? Is everything going to the left? So now all of our forces depend on the direction that we've labeled our position positive. So we've labeled z sub 3 to be positive moving to the right and now forget the externally applied force and maybe add that in last because that's just going to happen. That's just going to be in the direction that we move it and that might make z sub 3 go negative. That will take care of itself. We don't worry about that when we're formulating the equations. We just need the equations to be consistent with how we've labeled our diagram. We've labeled mass 3 to have a position z sub 3 and a velocity in the right direction. Now all of our equations need to be written consistent with that direction of z sub 3. So even though u sub 3 may in fact make mass 3 go left, when we virtually push mass 3 in the positive z3 direction that we've indicated, then the damper is going to oppose that going to the left. And the spring also will oppose that going to the left. Did that help? And then we, then at the end maybe we say, okay, oh, we're applying an external force and we have to account for whatever direction that's going.
So now we have to worry about the inertia, but if I worry about the inertia of mass 3, I'm worrying about that when I'm going in the positive z sub 3 direction. So did I forget to put that in my free body diagram? No, the other forces, the, the question was, are all of our forces going to always align with the inertial? You, I hate to make that general. Without the input, typically they're going to be going in the direction that, in this case, consistent with the inertial force. But I would just sort of, that drawing those directions, that's kind of the easy part. Now you have to write down what those equations actually are in terms of the positions that you've indicated to, so that they're consistent with the direction that you've indicated in your diagram. Now if we do our sum of forces, we have F sub I sub M sub 3 plus F3 B sub 3 plus F3 K sub 3 plus U sub 3 equals 0. So now that U sub 3 is not on the other side of the equality because it's in the same direction that all these others are, and we need the sum of the forces to equal zero. So the externally applied force is just going to go in the direction that it's been applied to your system. And we can now write the relationships for all of these forces. We now have m sub 3, z sub 3 double prime, plus B sub 3, and since the rightmost side of that dash pot was fixed, we now just need to worry about one velocity term, scaling that, plus K sub 3, and now what direction? We want the F3 sub K sub 3 to be going left, so now we need that to be Z sub 3 minus Z sub 1. So that when that's positive, K3 is positive, that will give us the force in the left direction that we've indicated. Plus U sub 3 is equal to 0. Now we need the free body diagram. for the massless point number four. So that now we have this point and we labeled its position to be z sub four. And if I now go back to my original diagram and I displace or move in that z sub four direction, what forces will respond or be created by that displacement. You see that dash pot B2 will give you a force and spring K sub 2 will both oppose that movement in the right direction, right most direction, so that now I have a force which is F sub 4 B sub 2 and here I have an F sub 4, K sub 2. And there's no mass, so there's no inertia associated with that point. And now the sum of the forces, they're both going in the same direction.
what is f4 sub b sub 2? It's b2, that's the coefficient. And then it's z4 prime minus z2 prime. And we have our F4 for K sub 2. And we want that to be going to the left when it's positive. So we have K sub 2 times. If Z4 is more positive or goes further than Z1, then we'll have a positive result from that difference and that times k sub 2 will be directed left. So that we now have this one being k sub 2, whatever I just said, that was z sub 4 minus z sub 1. And I can put all of those pieces together and I now have b sub 2 z sub 4 prime minus z sub 2 prime plus k sub 2 z sub 4 minus z sub 1 equals 0. Question? So now, I think the question is, what do we put in parentheses in our position or velocity expression that's getting scaled by our coefficients? And what, you, what I like to do is I like to think I've just dissected a, an old-fashioned ballpoint pen and I have a spring in it. And I pull that spring out and I just start playing with that spring and I simply put the spring down where I have it and so if the spring was k sub 2, and if I was looking at moving that massless point z sub 4 to the right, then I'm saying, oh, the spring needs to give me a force to the left. Now what's going to make that happen? So now if I have this spring and I move the right side of that spring a little bit more than the left side, it's going to pull me back to the left. So I try not to worry about which one's which. I just sort of try to visualize it or write it on the spot or as I look at it. But in this case, it would be, oh, I'm worried about point 0.4. That's Z4 minus Z1. And then I plug in some hypothetical numbers. I say, suppose Z4 is 3 and Z1 is 1. Oh, that gives me a 2 that's positive times some gain k sub 2, that will give me what I need going left. Help. And then the dash pots, I treat exactly the same, except I just remember that those dash pots are removing energy based on velocity and not positions. So I just have to worry about velocity differences instead of position differences. Yes? Which, which one? This one on point 0.4. So now on point 0.4, if I move, so now we're just moving relative to how we've labeled our diagram to begin with. And we labeled point 0.4 to be going positive to the right as z sub 4. So now if I'm just looking at that point and I try to move to the right, what's that spring going to want to do? it's going to try to pull it back to the left. That's why we drew that force for F4 sub K sub 2 going to the left. Yes, so now we're just looking at each individual piece in that particular free body diagram and saying what happens when we displace in the direction that we've labeled as positive. 
Do you see all of these equations you could rederive differently if we labeled these position directions going in different directions? So I guess getting back to your question earlier is, is it always going to be like Z4 minus Z1? Not if somebody's messed with your directions, positive directions. Here's what did I do? I basically made everything positive right. If somebody said, oh, I want Z1 to be right, I want Z2 to be left, I want Z3 to be left, and I want Z4 to be right. And you really have to pay attention when you're writing your equations. Because then you're trying to move relative to how all of those have been labeled. And you'll have to make sure that your differences are consistent with how they've been labeled. So because I labeled everything going to in one direction, that made it seem a little bit more clear. That if somebody erased some of these and moved them or made them go in the opposite direction, then you would have to account for that in your equations. Yes? So we won't, the question was, do we have any energy removal device that will be proportional to acceleration? And we're not going to consider that. We will just be using dampers and springs and masses, I think. <laughs> that should be enough to keep us busy for this semester. Other questions? But this is important to get all of this straight. But it's not hard. You just have to sort of sit down, take a pencil or a pen apart, and start thinking about what's going on. Maybe you can't take a pen apart anymore. You'll get ink everywhere. But if you could, do that experiment virtually. I bet there's a YouTube video on somebody taking a pen apart. Or you could write one, or write one. You could do one. And put, put YouTube in, U2 in the background, right? Then, then you have U2 in your equations. What's, what's our system now? What did we end up with? What's our system order, or how big is our state vector? And we've already answered that, right? At the beginning of class. What we need to do is add up the highest power derivative, or derivatives, of each variable. So now, in terms of the highest power derivative of Z1, what was that? We had to worry about acceleration, didn't we? So that's going to give us two state variables. We'll have position and velocity of Z1. Z sub 2, likewise. Z sub 3 was associated with mass 3. So it also could be modeled with position and velocity. And finally, Z4. <coughs> We didn't have a Z4 double prime, did we? We just had a Z4 prime. So this now says that that's 1. Now we have to really get into some high-powered math to figure our system order. And now we have a state vector. Now I could say, oh, our state vector x is what? It's z1, z1 prime, z2, z2 prime, z3, z3 prime, 
and Z forward. And if I differentiate that once, that will be on the left, and that will capture the highest power derivatives that we have in our equations of motion. Case, what I want you to do tonight is go through and think back on your ABCs. How big are your ABCD matrices if you said, I'm, my outputs I'm going to have for my positions of the three masses. Mass 1, mass 2, and mass 3. I have three outputs. Based on that, what would your A, B, C's, and D sizes be? And you'll need to report back on Friday. 